Catching me in my environment? Yeah, but you can't look at the camera now. This is Milwaukee, a city that moves not as fast as New York, but not as slow as Honolulu. It's a place where bartenders earn their regulars, and people are predictable because of where they eat, drink, and have fun. If you live here, you'll probably date a co-worker's ex without knowing it. And when you find out, you'll hate it, but you'll never say it. This is the good land. A city on a great lake where beer is better than coffee, Harley's Bee Crotch Rockets, and frozen custard tops ice cream all day long. If you've never stepped foot in Milwaukee, you've probably heard about this place because of its colleges and popular sports teams. Specifically, the Bucks and the Brewers. A sports city isn't complete without a rival. For Milwaukee, that rival has always been Chicago. Cirillo and Gian exchange words. Now Garner will come in. The umpires quickly interceding here. Boy, a lot Thank of bad blood. Bit. Yeah. A lot of bad blood between these two ball clubs. Here we go. They're coming in. The managers are going at it. Yep. This rivalry goes beyond city limits. It's a statewide kind of thing. In the 1980s, Illinois sports fans bestowed a derogatory nickname to their worthy adversary. They call Wisconsinites cheeseheads. Now, if you're into American football, you might recognize this nickname. The Green Bay Packers have legendary fans who proudly embrace their cheesehead status throughout the world. And when I say embrace, I mean really embrace. It was a, like a proclamation of sorts that, yeah. that recognized um, our, our cheese head hat as the official um, hat for the state of Wisconsin. Oh, so, there you yeah. go, yeah, yeah. See? If you're going to explore Milwaukee sports history and your show happens to be about business, there's not a better person to interview than Ralph Bruno. He's the inventor of the cheese head hat, which is worn by Packer fans around the world. He's the owner of Formation, a company that makes foam-oriented products. Their hats and wearables are sold in all 50 states and in more than 30 countries. And although the exact sales numbers aren't disclosed, it is said that if you took every cheesehead hat sold and lined them up, they would stretch across the U.S. and be making their way well into Hawaii. I know that it started with your mom's sofa. It was, I was reupholstering my mom's couch for her. Uh -huh. um, it was not in the worst shape, but it was just like it needed something, okay? So I was reupholstering my mom's couch, but during that period of time, I was also gonna be going to a Brewer game uh, back in 1987. And so people from Illinois have been calling us cheeseheads for a while, and so we were playing the White Sox. The Brewers were gonna be playing the White Sox at County Stadium. And so it's like they were calling us cheese heads and I thought, well, well, wouldn't it be cool to try to make something that was truly like a cheese head, something to wear, you know? Being that the couch cushion was taken care of, I still had the old piece of foam from, from hers. So I cut it in the shape of a triangle and added other cheese type elements to it, like burnt holes in it with a wood burner, which my mom was yelling at me, take that outside. I had to go outside for that. And then put it and glued it all together and made it into the form of a wedge and then uh, spray painted it like a kind of a cheddar kind of color too. So it was like all cheeses rolled up into one. I'm, I'm a pretty quiet, shy kind of guy that I'm not even really built to wear a cheese head really. So put it in the bag, go to the game. We're gonna be doing a little bit of tailgating outside of County Stadium. So we had uh, Pabst Blue Ribbons out and we had a few of those and we were having a good time. And then it was time to go into the baseball game and that's when I pulled the wedge out of the bag yeah. and, and put it on my head. And uh, the guys that I were with were like, no, no, no. And they were, it, it was kind of like a little mini scatter, a little mini scatter, they're gone. But um, 
we were walking in there and people were pointing at me and calling me a cheese head. And I'm like, hey, yeah, right, it, it is. And, and so as, as this was going on, these guys are like, you know, what's Bruno doing? You know, he's making a fool of himself. But a girl comes running up to me and wants to try the hat on. You know, so it's like here, yeah, sure, try it on, and and she was enjoying it too, and you know, then my buddies are like, well, wait, okay, Bruno, give me that hat. It's my turn now to wear the cheese. Yeah. So that's you know, that's through through the whole game that yeah. it just kept getting that kind of attention. You know, after that game, the wheels were just you know turning in my head about what can I do with this and and what what's the next step for that. If you haven't noticed by now, Milwaukeeans really enjoy eating cheese. This makes complete sense. Wisconsin is the largest producer of cheese in the U.S. The state is known as America's Dairyland and the cheese capital of the nation. Many of the dairy farms around here predate Wisconsin itself. There's only one question I have for those early immigrant dairy farmers. Did you have such delicious cheese curds back then? Because if you did, then you too lived a good life, my friend. Ralph Bruno is mostly known as the Cheesehead Guy, but he developed some of his business experience well before formation. What was life before the Cheesehead? I was brought up in a restaurant, in a, a bar slash restaurant business. My family had a family business. And my dad used to say to me that, um, you know, at the time I was working for somebody else, he goes, so one of these days, you know, you'll, you'll find that you'd prefer to work for yourself versus somebody else. And I said, no, dad, I'm, I'm real happy with putting my eight hours in and, and, <laughs> and coming home and then changing my clothes and going hanging out with my buddies. But through the process of transitioning and, and starting this other model and mold making business, I realized that I was I was kind of motivated into doing doing things. And, and again, it wasn't for like, when you say business, not the sense of making money. It was just like making something and doing something that that gave up, gave you the reward of the money, but yet the customer was the reward. Getting a customer that was willing to, you know, pay you for what it is that you wanted to do. That was where the, you know, the true thrill comes into it. And so, when the cheese head came into that part of it, it was like, all right, what do I do? Do I go down this this path that I've started? I was accomplished at pattern making. Um, I had made uh, pretty good money, way more money than my friends had been making at that side of things. But I had to, I would be tossing that aside and jumping into this cheese head thing. And, um, I don't know how my parents supported me, but they did. They, they, <laughs> you know, I was living at home, and and uh, uh, I sold my interests out to my partner that we were involved in that other business uh, for the pattern and model making. And and he said, you know, you're going to take that cheesehead thing, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's mine. And and then so we headed out of Dousman. I headed out of Dousman and and came to. Um, um, first and Beecher, which is called the Lincoln Warehouse over there, and that's yeah. that's where um, the next stop for our company was. Okay, okay, so. interesting. After you saw the popularity, what was, what was your first initial step to make more, to like refine the, the, the same one? Um, or what was your train of thought? So the first one was fabricated by hand by me that way. And, and I, you know, with my background in pattern making and model and mold making, I realized that to make these things by hand wasn't, it didn't make sense that that was, you know, for, for, for profit was not gonna work. So it was, what are the processes that we could look at doing for making more of these? So I looked into um, a bunch of different versions and variations of it, and ironically, I picked the hardest thing, which was to actually mold it out of, starting with uh, the raw components, the, the liquids, and, and mixing the liquids and pouring it into a mold. 
the e much easier choice would have been to continue to fabricate them and find the best method for fabricating. But like I said, that's not my style. It's like, eh, let's let's do it as you know, make it as challenging as possible. <laughs> right. So the fact of my background from making the molds allowed me to virtually create that form that was necessary to do the molding process. Then the next step was to try to figure out, okay, what is the seat cushion foam that everybody's sitting on? How is it, how is it processed in, in that? And so was able to find a company out in Waukesha, Wisconsin that, that made the raw components for the polyurethane foam. So um, called them on the phone and found my way through to uh, a technician in the lab that, again, really had no business talking to me because I, you know, I, I didn't know what I was talking about, but I said, hey, could you help me find this material? I'm looking to pour it into a mold and, and, and make some parts. And, and uh, he said, yes. And, and so he goes, do you have a mold? I said, I'll have one in a, in a couple of days. So went back, built a mold, you know, tried to make it look as much, used a lot of the geometry from the one that I had made uh, and worn to the game. And a couple of days later, went into this company and uh, spent a, a day in the lab with them. And we worked on um, the color. We worked on the density of the foam. And uh, by the end of the day, he's, you know, gave me two five gallon pails of, of this raw material. And I went back to the shop and got my drill press out and put a mixer in it and went to the, there was a liquor store right down the street in, in Dousman. This is when we were in Dousman, Wisconsin. And, and got a bunch of cups and started mixing and pouring um, foam into a mold and making cheese. Milwaukee was also known as the machine shop of the world. This city was a hub for innovation during the industrial age. Local historian Thomas H. Faring argues that the Milwaukee of centuries ago compares to the Silicon Valley of today. I believe him too. Some of my biggest client projects have been for companies over 100 years old. Six of the Fortune 500 companies have their roots firmly planted in the city. Quite a few of these native companies are still considered kings in their industries. Johnson Controls, Rockwell Automation, Joy Global, Briggs and & Stratton, and Harley-Davidson, just to name a few. Do you feel that there's a, a different business culture in Milwaukee? I, I think there are some areas that there are uh, other cities and other business climates that are kind of not lockstep, but very similar to, to what we have going on here. I, I, for me, it's been more of recognizing sizes of those businesses and companies that make it easier to relate to them. But I, I'll, I'll say this, though, that doesn't stop, my opinion, stop somebody from trying to associate or work with large corporations because, you know, we work with one of the largest corporations in the world, which is the Packers in the NFL, and we're, right. we're, we're small potatoes. And so, yeah. it, I mean, it can. But, I mean, uh, for the most part, it's easier, I think, to relate and and understand um, other businesses that are very similar in, in size. Yeah. Uh, even more so than what they actually do, I think that can be important because so many of the uh, same challenges that they have, we're all the same, you know, like whether it's employees of a certain quantity or things like that, those, those problems are very similar based on size. You know, it's more mechanical than anything. Yeah. Um, from the cultural side of things too, I say that, you know, we line up really well with, with other cities that have a lot of the same similar histories to us, like Pittsburgh or, you know, other yeah. things like that. Buffalo, there are, there are other cities that because of um, what they've gone through in the past, uh, a lot of the same, you know, uh, blue collar workers that they push their kids through college. A lot of that stuff is very similar uh, based, based on that. Over its lifetime, Milwaukee has dominated quite a few industries worldwide. And we're not talking about cheese anymore. Milwaukee once was the number one leading leather producer in the world. The city single-handedly produced most of the leather boots, belts, and other products used by the military in both world wars. 
And as if cows haven't already given enough, the booming meatpacking industry in the later half of the 1800s has also played a big role in shaping Milwaukee. If you drive from Milwaukee's airport to the downtown area, you're bound to see the city street signs that read Layton Avenue and Plankington Avenue. Both are named after prominent meatpacking founders. The city of Cudahy was named after Patrick Cudahy, a meatpacking brand that might have earned its place in your fridge even today. So make sure you hug a cow next time you see one. I, I feel like in a lot of the, the articles that I read about you, even the interviews, a lot of people are amazed that the same guy who invented it is still the same guy who runs it <laughs> after so many years, right? Uh, so could you uh, explain some of those, that like decision process in your mind to, instead of being hands-off, to be hands-on? I never really considered myself to be a perfectionist, but people say that I am to right. some degree. And so letting other people do things that that you're a part of can be challenging. Yeah. So I think I'll be honest and raise my hand and say I think that's a part of it is, you know, it's it's I don't think I'm anywhere near a control freak, but yet I have visions in my head of something from start to finish and I like it to go that way. Yeah. And so I'm as I'm getting older now and realize that I have to, you know, we need other people in a lot of different ways in our life, but also that other people have great ideas. And now, you know, within the last couple of years, because of this expansion, um, brought in a lot of people, both young and old, that have been uh, so, have been so fruitful for me because they're, they're stimulating me in so many different ways. And I've been able to hand over things to other people. And then I look at it and go, man, that's better than what I would have ever done or thought of. You know? <laughs> right. So um, I think that's a, it's a learning process for, for us all that way. Well, thank you for saying that, being honest, first of all, because I, I suffer the exact same thing is I'm just, I'm, I'm a very solo kind of a guy. So i Literally, my company has been just one per, one person show. Uh, a lot of things. I, I'm a programmer, which is very like solitary. And right now, where I'm at in life is it's challenging right now because I know if I want to grow beyond myself and something bigger than my own abilities, I have to trust people. But I also have to like find people that I trust. Um, so. I'm glad to hear that even after so many years of business that I would probably be the same. I'm a hands-on guy. I like to, you know, see, oversee things and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, what's your best advice to building a team and managing that as it scales? A lot of times it may be the, the what it's, how it's, how well it's working may only live in your mind or my, like in my mind thinking about this right and then so others are like guys are nuts he's, he's, he's nuts he's nuts so you got to be prepared and ready that people are thinking you don't have a chance to do what it is you're trying to do here so to to bring people in on it you know when you get somebody that that is there will be others that that you can you're motivating through in, in passion you know my passion with it and and maybe some of the in uh, ingeniousness of the, some of the more mechanical sides of things allowed people to say, "Well, okay, I'll, I'll listen to what it is he's doing, and I and and I'll come on board and 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 work with him on that." So uh, don't look for a lot of support. I mean, you just you're gonna have to fend for yourself. Find um, maybe friends and family that are that are gonna willing to give you something in terms of assistance not saying financially more so you know hey uh we're gonna we're gonna go to uh wisconsin state fair can you can you give me a couple hours of your time and, and sell cheese heads over there or something like that so uh, building those friendships and and team i mean i think it's got to start pretty early on uh, you know because you know doing every every everything yourself it's just it, it's impossible You didn't think I'd forget to mention beer, did you? There is one nickname Milwaukeeans are particularly proud of, and that's being known as the beer capital of the world. Locals like to call their hometown Brew City, 
After all, the baseball team here is named the Milwaukee Brewers, and rightfully so. The city has been home to some of America's largest brewers throughout the nation's history, such as Pabst, Schlitz, Blatz, and Miller. You haven't really drunk beer socially until you drink beer with Milwaukee people. Beer culture is strong here, and they like it all. Pilsners, IPAs, stouts, porters, ambers, blondes, barrel-aged, and the list can go on and on and on. My favorite kind of beer? Stouts. They're dark, creamy, and oh, so good. Is there anything in your personal life, specifically yeah, habits, disciplines, hobbies, that you feel have made a difference in the way you do business or in the success of your business? Yes, I think naiveness, and it, it, it's a kind of a cliche when you say naiveness was, was one of my best strengths. You, now, now you, you know, we have a lot of battle scars after 32 years of doing, so I got a lot of experience. Right. But that naiveness that you have, and what I mean, like, again, going into that banking world and, and not really uh, knowing anything and, and, you know, asking those questions that people would be like, you're really going to, you know, you're really going to ask that question? You're really gonna? And you go ahead and you do these things, right. and then you walk out with uh, things that people never thought would you, you get anybody to agree to, right? Yeah. Uh, happen. And, and so, or you do something that everybody's either tried before and it hasn't worked, and you're going to say, well, I'm going to do, give it, give it my try, even though so-and-so and everybody else says you can't be done, yeah. you know, and, and it's that classic where a, a red stop sign is a green light for me, you know, during certain things like that. And so we've come, uh, we found some great successes out of over, overcoming some of those things that aren't very traditional in, in ways of, of doing things, creative thinking. Now to the, to the bad side of that is yeah. you start trying so many things and now you got all these irons in the fire and you're pulling one out, that's too hot, this one's cold, this, you got too many irons in the fire. So that's that, that balance I think about trying to, trying to uh, move, maybe move too quickly and, and do too many things at one time. Right now we live in a, in a, in a world full of noise Right. We're bombarded by so many messages and all these different things about who we should be, who we shouldn't, um, what's right, what's wrong. What would be your best advice to someone needing a little bit more confidence or courage in expressing who they really are and bringing that person to their business or to their career? Mm -hmm. I think we all want that, you know, pat on the back kind of thing from from what it is that we do, um, and I think that that's that's a big part of uh, again what motivates us to doing that. I think a lot of it is looking for it subconsciously, looking for those pats on the back, but to recognize those and and get and get those that that feeling when you get those pat on the back as that's again a kind of an indicator as you're headed in you're heading in the right direction with things. When uh, people come back with responses that are negative, don't always look at it as that's the end of the story right there because they just gave me that. They may not even understand a bit of what you're about or what you're trying to do. And so that's a default setting is like, no, it's not gonna work, don't, don't do that. So I always find listening to people's advice uh, I try to take as much of it as I can. Right. And don't be afraid to like change directions too. Sometimes, you know, um, I've gone down paths where uh, I, you know, have thought that this was the way to do something and the only way to do something. And I've given it a lot of time and effort. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know what, it really is time to, to get off that part of it and, and go, go into a different direction too, so. Whatever thoughts you have about this obscure city, there's no doubt that the entire nation has benefited from its contribution during times of need and growth. 
Its blue-collar work history, coupled with its tendency to have fun, has set the tone for entrepreneurs here. If you're someone who likes to work hard and play hard, chances are you'll fall in love with this place. It's creativity and a good work ethic that makes all the difference for business owners here. And if you ever find yourself in Milwaukee, make sure to order a beer with a side of cheese curds to get a little taste of this underrated city. <laughs>